publication given by the Reverend Dr. John Gruber, University Chaplain. Most gracious God, as we depart this place, these halls of learning, give us the courage to face the new activities of our lives and may all new opportunities find us eager, not reluctant. If our way ahead should be easy, then let us show our gratitude by helping someone less fortunate. If our way ahead should be difficult, let us remember that all mountains can be climbed, just like all handicaps can be overcome. Keep us alert to the need for change and open as channels for divine power. Help us to keep ever keen the edges of our minds, that our thinking may be straight and true. Always, dear God, guard us from sin and dullness. Give us the will to keep our passions under control and the common sense to keep our bodies fit and healthy. For after all, our life is your greatest gift to us. Dear God, you know all of the secrets that will remake this world. Please carefully teach them to us that we may do our part to make this world a better place in our lifetime and grant us peace. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Of the Daytona Beach Cubs, Mr. Eric S. Dalton. distinguished guests to this, the most important and probably the most anticipated event on our academic calendar, graduation. We've set aside a photography area in front of the stage so that the families may come up and photograph the students. Please come up and take your pictures and then as a courtesy to others, we turn to your seats so that everybody will have a chance. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the president of Ember Riddler and Notre University, General Kenneth L. Tallman, who will introduce the speaker for today. President Tallman. Members of the graduating class, parents, friends, trustees, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure for me to add my welcome to all of you here this morning. And I think at the outset, it's appropriate for me to congratulate each of the graduates and their parents because you are the ones who deserve our accolades on this very special day. Today I have the pleasure of introducing an individual who has been involved with aviation in a very special way. Since joining the New York Times in 1954, Mr. Richard Whitcomb has devoted his efforts to aviation and space news reporting. He has been the transportation editor of the Times since September of 1968. To an audience of over a million and a half readers, Mr. Whitman has consistently provided fair and accurate news of the aviation world. His stories display an unusual depth of understanding of highly technical aviation topics. Mr. Whitman served in the Air Force during World War II as a P-24 pilot based in Italy accumulated some 33 combat missions, returned to the United States with the rank of captain, and having earned a distinguished flying cross and the Air Medal of the Civil Cluster. Over the years, Mr. Whitman has earned numerous honors and awards for his writing. Most recently, as a member of the New York Times team, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for their 1986 coverage of the Challenger disaster. Mr. Whitkin is a graduate of Harvard College, Kublai, and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. I might add that he plans to retire next month after some 35 years with the New York Times. But we're very pleased to have him on this special occasion. And it's a great honor for me to 
introduced to you, an individual who is a real friend of aviation and who has contributed greatly to a better understanding by the public of aviation accomplishments and aviation issues. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Richard Whitman. trustees, faculty, students, family, and friends. The Emily Post Book of Etiquette says a commencement address should commence with the speaker saying he's pleased and honored and humble, but the words have become a little devalued with much repetition, so I'd like to modify the script a little. Let's just say that this will be a very special day in my memory book, and that I genuinely appreciate the recognition especially since it comes from the premier aviation university on this planet. This is a very exciting and dynamic field you graduates are looking into. I stumbled into it in 1942 as an aviation cadet as a way of advancing from my high station as a drafted private in the coast artillery and I've seldom had a moment of serious regret that things turned out this way. Coming to Daytona Beach, I'm reminded that it's 30 years since the first and only other time that I've been to Daytona. And it's dizzying, really, to recall the pace of change in aeronautics in the interim. I drove up from Cape Canaveral one evening early in 1958 to pick up my wife and then five-year-old son at the airport here so they could join me in witnessing attempts to put the first U.S. satellites in orbit. Remember, this was a time when aerospace activities in this country had already reached a pretty sophisticated level. The airlines were beginning to make the transition from propellers to turbojet planes. Ballistic missiles were already being test flown. Yet, despite these technological leaps, visions of the industry's future were tempered, except in way out rocket society circles, by a large amount of conservatism. Let me give you a couple of for instances. I recall a good number of experts contending that because jets gulped so much fuel and needed such high takeoff speeds with such heavy fuel loads, only a handful of runways would be long enough to accommodate jet operations. Similar short-sighted thinking may be reflected in the reaction to initial announcements about a new Rolls-Royce jet engine that was being touted by our competitors in Britain. It was the Conway Bypass, apparently the first engine to slash fuel consumption by combining pure jet thrust with propeller-like bypass thrust. Some top-level American engineers insisted when asked about the announcements that the Rolls-Royce engine was not a very meaningful development. Today, the bypass, otherwise known as the turbofan, is the standard engine for airliners. And jets using them can get in and out of runways that are half the length the pessimists were relegating them to. If vision can often be lacking, it can also magnify out of all proportion the portent of what comes into a visionary's sights. <clears throat> Soon after World War II, numerous magazines were carrying advertisements showing Farmer Jones cruising over the rural Midwest at the controls of a Cessna, as though one could anticipate before long a puddle jumper in every barn. General aviation has come a long, long way, but that scenario has never come close to reality. I also remember the press release about 20 years ago disclosing that a respectably sized airline had ordered anti-collision devices for their planes. The order was ultimately canceled because the device was useful only if both airplanes in a potential mid-air were equipped with the device. And that was much too much for the pocketbook of the average general aviation pilot. 
Then in the summer of 1981, the Federal Aviation Administration announced that computer advances had finally made anti-collision systems practical. That was because only one plane had to be equipped, so long as the other one had a transponder with altitude reporting. It was confidently predicted that the airlines would be regularly flying with anti-collision systems by the end of the first Reagan administration. The second Reagan administration is about to end, and we're still waiting. In dredging up such remembrances, what I'm trying to underscore is that aviation is one of the most unpredictable activities anyone can get involved in. It was unpredictable when I first visited Daytona 30 years ago. It still is, though there is less excuse for limited vision from a generation, new graduates out there, that has grown up with lunar landings, micro-miniaturization of computers, and medical miracles. In any case, what I'd like to do is suggest that whatever career direction you take in aviation, you should hang loose, be ready to adjust rapidly to the outlook as it changes, as it is bound to, with disconcerting frequency. There is no professional career I can think of where fixed ideas and inflexibility can be so fatal as a career in aviation. Just look at the transitory nature of the large turboprop airliner at the Boeing Company's SST and People Express with its deep discounts. Bearing in mind this inherent unpredictability, I'd like to share some notions about where I think aviation might be headed. The would-be airline pilots among you know that galloping automation has robbed the job of a lot of the throttle jockey excitement that's been a prime attraction since the first powered flight at Kitty Hawk 85 years ago today. The most radical view has it that the cockpit of tomorrow will be made up of a super pilot and a dog. <laughs> the pilot will be trained to monitor all the electronic systems that are flying the plane. The dog will be trained to bite the pilot if he makes a move to touch anything. <laughs> I'm certain the airline pilot's job will provide other psychic rewards to make up for the adrenaline pumping elements of earlier days. These will be rewards that will come from mastering a challenging combination of technologies and operating the mass of integrated systems with a most demanding level of professionalism. The question is whether the nation can recruit and train enough top caliber people to operate a continually expanding fleet. To do so, I believe that the airlines will have to go a lot farther than they have so far in restoring the cuts in pilot pay levels that were a byproduct of deregulation. One factor that could moderate the demand for pilots is the threat that we might run out of sufficient runway space to handle a continuing increase in flight operations. This is a so-called capacity crisis, capacity on the ground at the heavily used airports. Of course, there's a parallel threat of overcrowding up in the air along the, main, the nation's major airways, but that threat should be easier to deal with. The three-dimensional sky is still a pretty big place. The current fashion is to deplore the fact that no major new airport has been added to the system in 15 years, and that the only big one that's really in the works in Denver, Colorado, is still years from reality. But because efficient air travel is so fundamental to a healthy economy, I think that enough interim measures can be taken to keep from running out of room while waiting for major new airports to come online. It will take a lot of intelligent planning in a partnership between government and industry. I foresee several trends taking hold as those responsible for airline operations conjure up ways to counter congestion. One is to fly larger planes with fewer frequencies. 
Hub and spoke operations have been a boom, but a balance must be struck between hubbing and spoking with a lot of agile little airliners and easing congestion by scheduling more non-stop flights on jumbo jets carrying 500 people. A twin-engine Boeing 737 or a McDonnell Douglas MD-80 takes up as much room in the traffic flow as a 747 or DC-10, but its productivity is only a fraction of its big brothers. On the other hand, in striking the right balance, one must get a handle on how many passengers want to go where. Another way to ease congestion is to modify cultural patterns so that fewer travelers feel that the only times to fly are in rush hours. I anticipate luring many more travelers to off-peak flights by low fare inducements. Maybe they won't be willing to fly at 3 a.m. like a Federal Express package, which is really what a business exec is doing when he catches the transcontinental red-eye from the West Coast. But if the savings are right, a lot of people will be ready to start out at noon or 10 p.m. People Express may be gone, but there are plenty of their backpack customers who won't mind a little adventurous austerity to see more of the world, provided the price is right. We may also be underestimating what can be done to ease the crush of today's major airports by developing new hubs and other reliever fields. In recent years, airline activity has boomed in places that not long ago were second and third tier centers of economic activity. With the high-tech boom in North Carolina, the Raleigh Durham Airport has become a budding Atlanta, and I think Orlando is beginning to reach that status too. I expect other such hubs will flourish as economic development spreads to other lagging areas. Up to now, I've avoided mentioning an area of change that could have the most profound effect on everyone in aviation. It's an area I've left to last because, frankly, I have the least amount of confidence trying to judge what's going to happen. It has to do with government, with how our government is organized and how it devises and implements aviation policy. Since this graduating class will doubtless provide some of tomorrow's aviation leaders, I'd like to suggest that you start getting involved right now, if you haven't already, in helping shape this future. The United States can either continue to be the dominant force in aviation, or it could see its dynamism and influence continue to diminish. Which way we go, with all that means for the nation's economy and overall strength, may well be answered in a governmental struggle that will be joined just as you graduates are rolling down the professional runway. The main battleground will be the Congress, and the chief issue will be how the FAA is to be structured and what resources will be allotted to it. The issue is coming to a head because in the past few years, the relationship between the FAA and the Department of Transportation, its parent agency, has been nothing short of a disaster. Because of this, many elements of the aviation community have been pushing mightily to remove the FAA from the department, to restore its independence. But other powerful forces, including some respected experts, oppose such a move. Time is too short to go into all the pros and cons of this issue. Many on both sides think the organizational structure is not the most important immediate issue. What is essential, they say, is to get action on a three-sided agenda. One, modify civil service rules so that more top-grade people can be recruited for the FAA. Two, modify procurement rules so the acquisition of high-tech equipment will not be delayed and delayed by the strangling effects of the current process. Three, find a means whereby the aviation agency can intelligently spend the millions, the billions, excuse me, what's another zero? The billions connected from aviation taxes and put in the trust fund earmarked for aviation projects. Just as important as organizational shapes and changes in rules is a matter of people. What can we do so that politics are subordinated and the new administration under 
President-elect Bush seeks out the best talent for important posts. It would be extremely helpful if a Mr. Aviation had emerged in this country, as Senator Sam Nunn has in arms control, for instance, who could significantly influence the outcome of the debate, whatever the right answer. I hope that before long, someone will pick up that challenge. You people who are graduating today can each make a contribution, whatever direction you take in this industry, by keeping in mind the nation's enormous stake in a healthy and dynamic aviation industry. It will not be easy to stay at the head of the parade, as our friends in a number of other high-tech industries have sadly discovered. But aviation would not be nearly so stimulating a field if we didn't have challenges to keep us fired up. The unpredictability, the unknowns, should keep your juices flowing and provide the potential for enormous satisfaction, even if course changes have to be punched into the computer now and then. I wish you all the very best. It has been a privilege and a delight to take part in your graduation exercises. Thank you very much. Sir, for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom with us. Each semester, an outstanding graduating senior is selected to receive the Chancellor's Award. Candidates for this award and distinction are selected on the basis of academic excellence, campus activities, and contributions to the university and the local community. These students are leaders who challenge others around them to think, to question, and to act. Candidates for this award are recommended by representatives of the faculty, staff, and the student body. The selection for this honor reflects campus-wide recognition of the recipient's outstanding accomplishments. I'm very pleased today to announce the senior who is receiving the Chancellor's Award. Teresa Heath, will you please come forward? Science degree in professional aeronautics from the Family National Dean's List, received the Theta Phi Alpha Scholastic Achievement Award, as well as several other scholarships. Now, in addition to her impressive academic record, Teresa has been active in the Army ROTC program and, in fact, is currently serving in the Army Reserves, having served as an air traffic controller in the military. She regularly contributes her considerable talents to many community projects, among them the Volusia County Easter Seals Campaign and the Special Olympics. Now, as is common to many high achievers, she also manages to find the time to share a smile with others when she visits our local hospitals and has spent considerable time and effort treating many of her fellow students. Here at Ember Riddle, she's been a regular volunteer in our annual fundraising campaign. Following graduation, Teresa plans to continue her education right here in the Master of Aeronautical Science program. Teresa, you truly exemplify the outstanding qualities and accomplishments embodied in the Chancellor's Award, and we're very proud to honor you with this and to recognize you as an outstanding graduate of Ember and Aeronautical University. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the president of the senior class, Adam Rose. Adam? President Tallman, Chancellor Noden, Mr. Whitkin, Dr. Gilson, Dr. John Paul Riddle, members of the Board of Trustees and Visitors, Academic Administrative Deans and Directors, distinguished guests, faculty, staff, parents, friends, and my fellow graduates. Good morning. <laughs> On behalf of the graduating class of December 1988, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Today marks the end of four long years of college studies. In just a matter of hours, we will all be graduates of this university. But what does it mean to be a graduate? Does it mean paying back all the debts to our family, friends, and banks? Yes, it does. 
Does it mean returning for homecoming and beating the faculty in a softball game? Yes, that's part of it too. Does it mean buying racks of clothes from the bookstore that say Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University on them that we couldn't afford as undergraduates? <laughs> yes, that's part of it also. But what it really means to be a graduate is that we have graduated from the finest aviation institution in the entire world. As we have closed yet another chapter in our lives, a newer, more exciting, and even more challenging chapter is being opened. In retrospect, we realize that our college experiences have given us many rewards. We have molded our personalities, given ourselves lifelong friendships, everlasting career skills, and striving ambitions for success. We have ended a chapter of peaks and valleys. The peaks, such as going to the first intercollegiate varsity basketball game, and the valleys, such as pulling an all-nighter on a last-minute turn -paper. These are the experiences that we will remember for the rest of our lives. We would like to thank our parents for caring, understanding, and for putting up with us when we asked for more money or when we wanted to buy a new car. They are all very exceptional people that we love dearly. They have given us the start of our careers. This brings me to a quote from Matthew 13, which applies to everyone in this auditorium. It says, A sower went forth to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the birds came and ate them up. Some seeds fell among stony ground, where they had little soil, and they sprouted quickly because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and they had no roots, so they withered away. Some seeds fell among the thistles, and the thistles shot up and choked them. But some fell among good ground, where they bore fruit, yielding some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some hundredfold. Each one of us here graduating today is one of those seeds planted in good ground. With the proper cultivation, we can all bring in a bumper crop of wealth and successes. At this time, I would like to thank all the faculty and staff members who made this day possible. All of you, one way or another, have impacted our lives. Among you, we have chosen a small sample of the many fine individuals. These are the recipients of the Outstanding Faculty and Staff Awards. As your name is called, please stand. Please hold your applause until the final recipient has been announced. <coughs> Mr. Boyd Ulrich, Aircraft Engineering Technology. Dr. James Lattison. Aeronautical Engineering. <laughs> Mr. Shannon Trevin, Aeronautical Science. Mr. John Brand, Avionics. Dr. John Wheeler, Humanities, Social Sciences. Mr. William Runyon, Computer Science. Mr. David Esser, Flight Technology. Mr. Donald Hendrickson, Maintenance Technology. Mr. Richard Ohm, Maintenance Technology. Dr. Milton Horowitz, Aviation Business Administration. <laughs> Ms. Phyllis Salmons, Math, Physical Science. Captain Charles Brindell, Military Science, Air Force ROTC. Sergeant Major Dennis Scanlon, Military Science, Army ROTC the Outstanding Staff Award winner, Ms. Kathy Novak, Student Activities. Congratulations to each Outstanding Award winner. Finally, 
finally, as president of my graduating class, I would like to thank all my classmates for the unforgettable experiences we have all enjoyed. On a personal note, I would like to thank two special people in the audience this morning. Without their love and encouragement, I would not be standing here before you today. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for just being you. In closing, I leave you with the Latin phrase, Kalepata Kala. Translated into English, this means not without labor. My fellow graduates, good luck in all your future endeavors. And remember, anything worth accomplishing cannot be done without labor. Thank you. to have several Armed Forces Commissioning programs active on the Daytona Beach campus. The Air Force ROTC detachment has the largest elective enrollment of any civilian institution in the country, and this year it was selected as the number one Air Force ROTC detachment in the country. The Army, the Army ROTC detachment has one of the highest growth programs in the nation. Eighteen of our graduates have become the newest second lieutenants in our nation's armed forces. 11 in the United States Army, and 7 in the Air Force. We're very proud of these people, and I'd like them all to stand now and be recognized. The nation's newest second lieutenants. <laughs> and now it's time to get to the business at hand. The graduation exercises will now be conducted by Dr. R. Luther Reisbeck, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Daytona Beach Campus. Dr. Eisman. Candidates for the degree of Associate in Science in Professional Aeronautics. Program Chairman, Mr. William Mason. Stephen Lee Messler. <laughs> Candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Professional Aeronautics. Program Chairman, Mr. William Mason. Room. John E. Larson, Roy J. Montgomery, Martin F. Byrne, candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Professional Aeronautics, Program Chairman, Mr. William Mason. Stephen Gerard Chorba. Paul Allen Connor. Gary A. Dalkey. <coughs> Stephen L. Davies. Charles William Dupont, Jr. <laughs> Teresa Ann Heath. Omicron Delta Kappa, Kumara. Idris A. E.A. Douglas Lee Johnson. Newell Warrington Hong III. Scott Douglas Molzan. Kingsley O'Brien Nelson. Clifford G. Page. Mark T. Palin. Perry Leon Paul Hemis. Robert A. Petnecki. Martin Boyd Quinlan, <laughs> Timothy Clinton Ridge, Manu Kumare, 
Richard B. Sanders. Kosalati Anderson Sivabda. Roger A. Smith. Earl Dwayne Sutherland. Oh, we did it, huh? Candidates for the degree of Associate in Aviation Maintenance Technology. Program Chairman, Mr. Paul S. Taylor. Linus B. Chernius. <laughs> Harry Belcher. Christopher James Delfino. Dwayne A. Diamond. Radeem A. Elizabi, Dean Roger Goodrich, David William Kresge, Roderick Gregory Martino, Michael Russell Ryder, Candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Avionics Technology, Program Chairman Mr. E. Nolan Coleman, Derek T. Joe, Alan J. Overlander, Senior Class Counsel, Peter C. Serklin, Candidate for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Airway Science, Program Chairman, Mr. <laughs> Wayne Mason. Amir Tafik. Candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Aviation Technology, Program Chairman, Mr. John Brandon. Second Lieutenant, Amilcar Rene Calero. Martin Joseph Campanella. David Allen Cox. John Robert D'Adorio. Charles L. Friday, from Robert. Jose A. Lamas. Jose M. Lanzas, Senior Class Congratulations, Louis John Otito. George W. Maddox. Mark Spencer McGowan. Carlos Roberto Morales. Reggie V. Mayer. Raymond R. Second Lieutenant Damien C. Craigold. Yep. Clifford J. Williams. Well, well, congratulations, you made it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Douglas Richard Yenser, from Lobby. <laughs> Saeed S. Zaidi. Candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Studies, Program Chairman, Mr. William Mason. Mohammed Al Sharia. John P. Bukowski. Congratulations, first off for you. Oh, very good. 
James J. Hoke. Where's Hoke? There we go. Go back there. Good. Congratulations. Good luck. Robert D'Agostini. Austin Mass. Congratulations. Congratulations. James G. Kerr. James D. Kozarski. James J. Matusak. <laughs> Gerald P. McKinnon. Ronald R. Hass. Christina Veer. Jay Kevin Michalowski. <laughs> Louise Christine Money. <laughs> Patrick F. Watson. Jonathan H. Muller. James T. Murray Blake William Hacker. Bardia Nayas Tani. We're really rough on you here, right? Eric Johannes Nielsen. <laughs> Melissa Onoff. <laughs> Colin E. Osborne. <laughs> Ramon H. Pickon. <laughs> David Petrus. David James Piper. Congratulations, Steve. Eric Ludman, Kumar. Congratulations, Steve. Adam Rose, President, Senior Class Counsel. Congratulations, Doug Kenneth Brian Schaefer. Roy Cameron Sears. It was good talking, Adam. Yeah, good Susan Stahl Seelig, who's who, 1988-89. Richard A. Schreck. Congratulations, Steve. Where are you going to go? John Daniel Spangers. <laughs> Kieran Joseph Sullivan.
George Del Toro. What's your name? Deputy. Mary Joan Dillon Kumai. Manuel Hyde Fernandez Lano, Senior Class Counsel, Society of Collegiate Journalists. Congratulations, Steve. Where's home for you? Jose Ralph Morales. Congratulations. Danette Garcia Moorhead, Senior Class Counsel. Congratulations, where's home for you? Puerto Rico. Paul Michael Heiss. Cheryl R.S. Murray. Where are you going to go, Dino? Andrew Joel McGibbon. Alia F. Mokhtar. Ken A. Hero. Lawrence P. Gaw. Congratulations, 
John. Charlotte Ann Day. Lois Ann Duggar.
the will all the candidates for the degrees please rise. Mr. Harrington, upon the recommendation of the faculty of the university, it is my honor to present to you the candidates for graduation. By the authority vested in my in by me and the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon appropriate the associate degree, the associate in science degree, the bachelor's degree, the bachelor of science degree, and the master's degree with all rights, privileges, honors, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Congratulations, graduates. You may now move your tassels from right to left.
This has a special meaning to me that I will never forget. Thank you. Mr. Edward W. Stimson, the Chairman of the University Board of Trustees, will now conduct the conferring of the honorary degree. Jeff Whitcomb and Dan Dodd, would you please come forward? Richard Whitcomb, a graduate of Harvard College, cum laude, and of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, has been transportation news editor of the New York Times since 1968. Joining the Times in 1954 as an aviation specialist, he worked for a time as a general reporter and rewrite man before turning his full attention to aviation and space news reporting. He became aerospace news editor in 1963. Mr. Whitkin has won many prizes for his writing, including the Page One Award of the Newspaper Guild of New York, several TWA Aviation Awards, the 1975 Publications Award of the Flight Safety Foundation, a Presidential Citation in 1983 from the Air Traffic Control Association, the Lyman Award in 1985 from the Aviation and Space Writers Association, and in 1986, as a member of the New York Times, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the Challenger disaster. It is said of Mr. Whitkin that his reporting is consistently fair and accurate. His stories reflect a depth of understanding of technical aviation topics, which most general press aviation reporters lack. A recent award nomination for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association stated that Mr. Whitkin has managed over the years to take the highly charged topics of aviation and aviation safety and consistently write about them in a reasoned and fair manner making sense out of the technically complicated and emotionally volatile issues. In tribute to his sustained record of fair and accurate coverage of the aviation and space news, resulting in better understanding of aviation by the general public, Henry Riddle Aeronautical University is proud to confer upon Mr. Whitman the honorary degree of Doctor of Aeronautical Science. Congratulations, Dr. Whitman. most aviation writer in America, and I know your retirement from the New York Times next month is not going to mean your retirement from the industry and the great contributions you've made over the years. So, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, and upon the recommendation of the faculty, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Aeronautical Science, Honoris Causa, with all the rights, privileges, honors, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Dr. Whitman. Very, very much. I don't intend to get into a rocking chair, particularly after coming down here and seeing Henry Riddle and getting so enthused and excited by what I saw in my tour of the place yesterday. It's, it's a real gung-ho organization, and I'm going to try to keep busy freelancing it. I'll remember this day always, and thank you very much for letting me participate. support of two groups of people play a very important role in the success of our university, the Board of Trustees and the Board of Visitors. Will members of these boards who are here please stand so that we can recognize you, members of the Boards of Trustees and Visitors. The individuals who played a major role in preparing our graduates for their future careers are the faculty. Will the faculty please stand and be recognized? families of the graduates. Their love and support have made this day possible. Will you please stand? 